I think for the next uh, 45 minutes, I want to uh, give the audience here an overview of what we've been working on on uh, stem cells and clinical genomics for uh, clinical trial in a dish. Before I start, uh, here's my uh, disclosure uh, statement. Uh, so let me just uh, start with a brief uh, clinical case. As uh, Carol mentioned, I'm a, a cardiologist. And so here you have a 57-year-old man, uh, previously uh, healthy, uh, comes to the cardiology clinic for newly diagnosed non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Uh, he was found to have a severely reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. Uh, his uh, family is re uh, remarkable for uh, multiple sudden uh, cardiac deaths, premature affair, heart failure, hypertension, prompting a clinical genetic uh, screening. And then his genetic uh, panel came back to have a pathogenic, a pathogenic variant in the laminate C. And so the question is uh, to us as uh, uh, the clinicians taking care of the patient, how does that uh, affect our management? And so uh, just keep this case in mind. And so I want to uh, start by telling you about uh, the Precision Medicine Initiative. Uh, this is a uh, quite exciting, started by President Obama back in 2015. And much of this is made possible by uh, recent advances in uh, next generation sequencing, uh, bioinformatics, big data, AI machine learning. And then the idea is that by understanding our genes along with our environment and lifestyle, uh, the hope is that we can better predict which uh, treatments uh, uh, might work best for us. Now, in my opinion, uh, there are three key technology breakthroughs that marries a precision medicine. Uh, in basic science uh, breakthrough. I think the first uh, technological breakthrough is uh, uh, DNA sequencing, or next-gen sequencing, which uh, has become much cheaper, faster, uh, lower uh, error rate, broader coverage, uh, and much faster turnaround time. Uh, so for example, back in 2000, it cost you about a billion dollars in over 13 years to get your DNA sequence. And today, we could get your DNA sequence for about $500 with turnaround time about three to four weeks. And with increasing uh, usage of uh, next-gen sequencing, the hope is that we can make our clinical care much more predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory with the four Ps of precision medicine. Uh, in my opinion, the second technological uh, breakthrough is the various types of genome editing technologies, uh, starting first with the uh, zinc finger nucleases, and then Talon and the CRISPR-Cas9, uh, discovered by Iman Rashapantir and Jennifer Dutton uh, back in 2011. And then I think, as you all know, using these uh, genetic scissors, you can now modify the DNA of organisms, plants, animals, uh, stem cells with extremely high precision. Uh, I think it's already been used for uh, cancer therapies and hopefully uh, inherited cardiovascular disease in the near future. And then in my opinion, the third technological breakthrough is a human-induced uh, pluripotent stem cell platform. Uh, this was uh, pioneered by Dr. Shana Yamanaka, as you all know. And the idea here is now you can now generate patient-specific and disease-specific uh, iPS cells, which provides you with a test bed uh, to validate your human genetic variants using your CRISPR editing that I just mentioned. Uh, this then allows you to characterize a disease phenotype, identify molecular targets, and implement uh, personalized medicine. And uh, as I mentioned, I'm a uh, clinical cardiologist, and we have a uh, close working relationships with our uh, clinical colleagues. And so over the past uh, 10 years or so, uh, our lab has made uh, iPS cells uh, from uh, more than uh, 1,800 patients uh, with different uh, genetic uh, backgrounds and uh, cardiovascular uh, diseases. And um, we can then, from these iPS cells, we can then generate these uh, patient-specific 2D uh, micro-pattern human cardiomyocytes, uh, 3D uh, human cardioorganoids, and also 3D uh, human uh, engineered heart tissues for disease modeling and also for uh, drug screening. Now, these iPS cells can be used to uh, understand disease mechanism, can be used for drug discovery. They can also be used for regenerative medicine purpose, as you all know. Uh, because of time, I will only focus on these uh, two uh, applications here and skip the last one here. Uh, however, I do want to mention that uh, we are in the midst of a uh, phase one uh, study uh, using uh, human embryonic stem cell derived cardiomyocytes in patients with uh, uh, chronic ischemic cardiomyopathy at uh, Stanford. Uh, and I just want to show one slide here. Uh, this is a study design that is being done at Stanford. I'm the uh, PI for the study. Uh, it involves uh, patients with uh, ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy. Uh, this will be a safety study with dose escalation of 50 million, 150 million, and 300 million cells. And so far, we have a complete injection in uh, six patients, and we hope to report back uh, a year from now when we uh, complete the uh, study. 
So with that as a background, I want to give you some examples of how we then use DNA sequencing, genome uh, editing, and human iPA cells to answer key biological questions related to uh, cardiovascular disease. And uh, shown here is a schematic of different causes of heart disease, uh, which falls into three major buckets as shown here. The first bucket is uh, primary cardiomyopathies, and this could be genetic or acquired. Uh, and then genetic cardiomyopathies could include, for example, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy, and so forth. Acquired cardiomyopathies could be, for example, COVID uh, myocarditis uh, here. And then next is uh, second, uh, secondary cardiomyopathies, which could include, for example, chemotherapy or radiation-induced uh, cardiotoxicity. And then the third bucket is the more common causes that are likely uh, polygenic, such as uh, coronary artery disease, hypertension, and uh, congenital heart disease. And so over the past uh, two decades, uh, our knowledge of cardiovascular genetics and epigenetics have also uh, increased dramatically. Uh, for example, we now know that there are different types of genetic changes, such as single nucleotide polymorphism, copy number variation, and also chromosomal uh, aberrations. We now know that there are different types of epigenetic changes, uh, such as uh, histone uh, uh, modification, DNA modification, and non-coding uh, RNA. And these genetic and epigenetic uh, changes then play important roles in causing coronary artery disease, uh, cardiac arrhythmias, uh, cardiomyopathy, aortopathy, uh, dyslipidemia, and also uh, play an important role in pharmacogenomics. And so I'll just show you a couple examples of what we've done uh, looking at uh, some of these uh, questions. So the first example I want to show is a familial hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, SCM. Uh, this affects about one in 500 people, one in 500 people. Uh, this is one of the most common causes of sudden cardiac death uh, in young adults. Uh, and then clinically, uh, these patients have uh, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction and also cardiac arrhythmia. You can see here the echocardiogram shows somebody with very, very thick uh, muscles. Uh, this is a diagnosis of exclusion when you have an athlete who passes on the football field or basketball court. And then to date, more than 500 mutations have been identified across more than uh, 30 genes. And then about 12 years ago, uh, we were referred a uh, large family with familial hypertrophic cardiomyopathy by our heart failure uh, specialist. Uh, the mother here uh, has uh, HGM uh, with symptoms of cardiac arrhythmia, and she has uh, uh, eight kids. Uh, the two oldest already manifest the HGM phenotype as shown by the black box. Whereas uh, kid number three and kid number eight, they're both genotype positive but phenotype negative, most likely because they were still younger at that time. And then through a whole series of experiments as shown here, we were able to show that this particular myosin heavy chain seven mutation with arginine to histidine switch at codon 663, it causes increase in cellular calcium, which leads to calcium handling defect and a cellular arrhythmia. It also causes activation of the NFAT signaling pathway which then leads to hypertrophic responses. And importantly, this allows us a, a platform to screen for drugs. And then here we're able to show that if you treat it with a calcium channel blocker, such as verapamil, or a beta blocker, such as a propanolol, it can be used to reverse at both the cellular uh, arrhythmia as well as the cellular hypertrophy. So this is one of the earliest examples of how we use patient-specific uh, cardiomyocytes as an in vitro platform for uh, drug screening. And then now the example of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy I show you are considered classic uh, Mendelian genetics, right? And so it has a strong genotype-phenotype correlation. But I think as you all know, uh, human genetics is much more uh, complicated and much more messy, especially uh, when you're dealing with uh, variants of uh, unknown significance as shown uh, in this uh, particular uh, patient. This is really a clinical conundrum for uh, clinicians who are taking care of these uh, patients. And so for example, shown here, uh, is the proband, uh, who is a healthy middle-aged man who underwent DNA sequencing as part of an executive uh, VIP workup. Uh, he was found to have a likely pathogenic variant in myosin light chain 3 uh, with assisting the allodine switch at codon uh, 170. Uh, and then along with also several members of his family, including his mother, his brother, and also his uh, daughter. So the clinical dilemma is this. What do we do with a healthy individual in which a DNA sequencing shows possible pathogenic uh, variant? And I'm going to explain to you so that it's uh, understandable for a non-clinician. Um, you can wait for 10 years and see if more papers come out to describe whether this uh, pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant is bad or good. On the other hand, hypothetically, uh, he's a VIP. He take a long flight from uh, San Francisco to 
uh, Europe, and he develops a blood clot in the leg, gets a deep venous thrombosis. The, uh, the blood clot goes to the lung, causes pulmonary embolism, dies from the uh, pulmonary embolism. The uh, coroner's office and the hospital in Europe uh, can't figure out what the cause is, and young guy who dies out of a son it's going to be annotated as sudden cardiac, most likely sudden cardiac death, right? And so what do you do with somebody who's annotated as sudden cardiac death because it happens that the wife is a lawyer, right? And the wife is going to do what? She's going to sue you and say, hey, doc, uh, you did a DNA sequencing on my husband. It came out as a pathogenic, likely pathogenic variant. How come you didn't do anything about it, right? Um, and on the other hand, if you uh, try to trigger some action and you try to do a whole bunch of uh, testing, uh, cardiac MRI, a whole to Zyopath, and all sorts of things. In the middle of the night, at three o'clock uh, in the morning, uh, when this person is uh, you know, working on his assignment, he gets a palpitation, he's gonna call you as, he, as his uh, concierge doc and say, hey doc, you know, I'm getting palpitation, so you're gonna get a lot of phone calls from this patient. And so this case is actually referred to us uh, to see, well, what's going on here? And so uh, here we first generated uh, iPS cells from the family members and showed that the cardiomyocytes were normal at baseline, as shown here. And then we uh, introduced a homozygous variant by CRISPR genome editing, meaning that the co uh, patient now has two copies of this potentially pathogenic variant, yet his cardiomyocytes are normal. And then when we in, uh, introduced, uh, disrupted the healthy allele by introducing a frame shift uh, mutation, the cardiomyocytes were also uh, normal, meaning that what was annotated as a potentially pathogenic variant allele, it was still able to perform a uh, normal function. And then finally, just to make sure our uh, assay is working, uh, when we genome edited a well-known pathogenic variant of myosin 19 3 we started seeing uh, cardiac arrhythmia uh, in these uh, cells. Uh, showing that the steps that we're doing is actually correct. So based on these uh, four steps and based on the fact that the patient himself was clinically healthy, we concluded that what was initially uh, a likely pathogenic variant is actually most likely a benign variant. And uh, because of this uh, study, the ClinVir has also now included our findings in the annotation of this particular variant. Uh, and now. Just keep in mind that uh, if this proved uh, to be effective, uh, you know, you'll see a lot of applications of this approach using iPS cells and genome editing to adjudicate uh, many of these uh, variant uh, calls. Now, besides the classic genetic uh, mutations with SGM and the VUS that I just uh, showed you, we're also interested in uh, studying the impact of single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNP. Now, in this case here, we focus on the SNP for aldehyde dehydrogenase. Uh, this is uh, one of the most common genetic polymorphism uh, in the world. This enzyme deficiency uh, is present in about 8% of the world population, uh, about 35% uh, among East Asians. Uh, it causes uh, alcohol flush reaction, which include flushing, <coughs> nausea, headache, and tachycardia. Now, antibus or disulfiram works uh, the same uh, by blocking uh, this enzyme, and it's used to help alcoholics uh, stop uh, drinking. Now, interestingly, the aldehyde dehydrogenase 2 polymorphism involving the glutamic acid to lysine switch, this has also been linked to increased coronary artery disease, more severe outcome after heart attack, higher incidence of hypertension, and also increased complications for type 2 uh, diabetes. So I'm actually a heterozygous a carrier. So, uh, you know, my father, he can drink a whole bottle of wine without any problem, but, you know, if I drink uh, just half a glass, my heart rate will shoot up from basal of about 50s to 130s uh, within uh, uh, 20 minutes. And so, uh, and I will actually have a facial flushing like this. And so this actually piqued my interest in terms of studying this. Um, and this slide shows that the enzyme deficiency, well documented to be a risk factor for CAD, coronary artery disease, uh, here in uh, Japanese men. <laughs> and also in uh, Korean men and also in uh, Han Chinese uh, here. And so to model this, uh, we recruited 10 Stanford undergrads who are of East Asian descent. Five of them are wild type, which means they can drink without any problem. Five of them are heterozygous, which means they have similar symptoms like I do, facial flushing, tachycardia, headache, and so forth. Now, if you're a homozygous mutant, which is about one to 2% of the uh, East Asians, the symptoms get even more uh, severe. And so here we model the myocardial infarction by exposing the cardiomyocytes to hypoxia. And as you can see here, the wild type cardiomyocytes here tolerated hypoxia quite well with minimal apoptosis, 
with heterozygous uh, cardiomyocytes, you have significant uh, apoptosis uh, with the hypoxia. So overall, uh, we believe the enzyme is not only involved in detoxifying uh, alcohol, it is also involved in getting rid of a ROS, so reactive oxygen species. And after heart attack, there'll be tons of ROS that gets activated. And if you're deficient in this uh, enzyme uh, activity, you have a harder time getting rid of these uh, ROS, and hence leading to more cell death, and perhaps explaining for the uh, worse uh, clinical outcome observed in epidemiology studies. Now, as a follow-up study, we recently used uh, iPSL derived endothelial cells uh, from patients with these uh, ALDH deficiency versus uh, control. Now, remember, alcohol is broken down to acetaldehyde, which is toxic. It causes uh, DNA damage, uh, increased loss, and increased vascular inflammation. Acetaldehyde is then broken down to acetic acid, which is non-toxic, and the enzyme involved in that is uh, aldehyde dehydrogenase. So again, if you're missing this uh, aldehyde dehydrogenase, uh, Any time when you drink, you have more buildup of this uh, toxic acetaldehyde in our body. So this is a follow-up study. As I mentioned, we exposed these iPS endothelial cells now to the alcohol to show uh, more vascular dysfunction. And importantly, we also did a uh, compound library screen and molecular docking analysis. And we showed that there's a drug, SGLT2 uh, inhibitor, uh, embaclifazone. It can actually be used to mitigate uh, the vascular uh, dysfunction. And we demonstrated that the embaclifazone alleviates that this ALDH-induced oxidative stress by inhibiting the sodium hydrogen antiporter 1 and also by activating the AKT ENOS pathway. And then the embaclifazone also improved the endothelial uh, dysfunction in mouse models of diabetes and also uh, alcohol exposure. And so taken together, these findings uh, suggest that, uh, you know, if you, as a cardiologist, uh, you know, my advice is that if you're drinking, drink less. Uh, if you're not drinking, don't start drinking with the assumption that it's gonna improve your vascular health, which is not true. Um, <clears throat> so this is uh, just one of the, uh, one example of using race-specific IPA cells uh, to study ethnic uh, differences. And undoubtedly, you'll see more and more examples of investigators using IPA cells from different ethnicities to study various biological questions in the next few years. Uh, for example, from a health and science perspective, uh, we're interested in understanding how African Americans have much more hypertension, why Hispanics have much more diabetic vasculopathy, why South Asians, for example, Indians and Pakistanians have much more uh, metabolic syndrome. And I'll already give you the example of East Asians with this uh, aldehyde dehydrogenase. So I want to switch gear now to the uh, second part of my talk, uh, which is on how we then use these iPS cells for drug screening. Um, and this is a major focus of uh, research in my lab. Um, I think there are several reasons for developing this uh, model. And you know, this includes, uh, as I just showed you, uh, understanding the disease mechanism. And by understanding the disease mechanism, this would then allow you to identify uh, novel molecular targets and then develop new drugs that can ultimately improve uh, human health. And this process is actually quite time consuming, expensive. And for example, it typically costs about one to two billion in about 10 to 15 years to bring a, a, a new drug from drug discovery phase uh, through clinical trials through uh, market approval. <laughs> now even worse, uh, many of the drugs that you take today actually do not work at all. So shown here the top 10 highest sales for drugs in the US, blue means the drug works and red means the drug does not work. And so for Abilify, for example, uh, this is used to treat schizophrenia. Out of five people, uh, the drug only helps one person. Uh, for Nexium, uh, this is used to treat the heartburn. Out of 25 people, the drug only helps one person. And so overall, this is pretty uh, poor response rate, and this is the reason why the editorial here is uh, uh, titled Time for One Person uh, Clinical Trial. And so in particular, we have an interest in chemotherapy drugs, uh, and that's because heart disease and cancer account for the top two causes of morbidity and mortality in the U.S., and as more cancer uh, patients survive due to better chemotherapy and also immunotherapy, more patients will end up with heart failure symptoms uh, due to cardiotoxicity from these uh, drugs. And so as an example, uh, shown here is a study we published about uh, seven years ago uh, in which we're interested in understanding uh, the mechanism of cardiotoxicity from doxorubicin, uh, which is given to breast cancer patients. And so here we recruited eight breast cancer patients a year later, some of them had normal cardiac function, while others had doxorubicin-induced cardiomyopathy. We generated their patient-specific cardiomyocytes, exposed them to doxorubicin, 
and then set up these assays as I listed here. And then here, as a proof of principle, we show that if we pick the right patients appropriately, these cardiomyocytes can be used to recapitulate which patients are more susceptible to uh, doxorubicin induced uh, cardiotoxicity. And so this slide shows the patient profiles. Uh, we recruited four healthy uh, individuals as control. We uh, also recruited four breast cancer patients who were treated with doxorubicin, but did not develop any heart failure symptoms, which we call dox. We also recruited four breast cancer patients who were treated with doxorubicin, but developed cardiotoxicity, which we call dox-tox. Now, none of these patients in the dox-tox group had other cardiac conditions, such as congenital heart disease, previous heart attack, or uh, others that could confound the clinical uh, presentation. And so here, for example, you have a 40-year-old woman uh, who uh, relatively young, ejection fraction, heart function is 77% normal. After chemotherapy, uh, it went down to about 36 to 40, uh, 50%. And so for one of the experimental designs, uh, we exposed the cardiomyocytes from the DOX group versus the DOX-TOX group uh, to the same dose of doxorubicin. And as you can see here, in one micromolar, the DOX-TOX cardiomyocytes had much more sarcomere disarray, suggesting damage to the cellular architecture. And one micromolar, the DOX-TOX cardiomyocytes had more cell death. And one micromolar, the DOX-TOX uh, cardiomyocytes also had much more cell arrhythmia and much more uh, cellular apoptosis compared to the uh, DOX group. So this is quite interesting, and I think the best way to explain this is this. I think, as you all know, the SNPs can have protective effect, as shown by the green uh, box right here. They can have predisposition effect, as shown by the red uh, bar right here, or uh, they can have a neutral effect, as shown by this uh, gray bar here. Now, the problem is that it's very difficult to predict clinical phenotype based on SNPs alone, because we still do not have an accurate uh, picture of all the SNPs that are either cardioprotective or cardiotoxic. So you may have a patient whom you think is at high risk, uh, but it turns out he or she is at low risk because of many uh, unknown protective SNPs. Vice versa, you may have a patient who you think is at low risk because of SNP, but it turns out he or she is at high risk because of many other unknown uh, bad SNPs. And therefore, the true cardiotoxicity profile may be better reflected by using these patient-specific cells that encapsulate uh, all of the patient's SNPs and present as a composite cellular phenotypic reader. Now, besides the doxorubicin, uh, other popular chemotherapy drugs that you may have heard of uh, include, for example, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, or TKIs. Uh, TKIs kill cancer cells by inhibiting the phosphorylation activity of hyperactive receptor tyrosine kinases. And then common TKIs uh, include, for example, Gleevec and Sutent. Uh, these inhibit VEGF uh, R2 and also PDGFRB in cancer cells, but they can also cause uh, cardiac uh, toxicity as a side effect. And that's because uh, both VEGF and PDGF uh, signaling pathways are also critical regulators of cardiovascular development. And so in this study here, we generated iPA cells on 13 patients, treated them with 21 most common TKIs and came up with what we call a cardiac safety index that allows us to predict which TKI is cardiotoxic and which TKI is not as shown uh, here. So our ultimate goal is to further optimize uh, this uh, cardiac safety index so that we can better predict the profiles of any drugs that you give to us uh, to see whether it's cardiotoxic or not. Now, I think in the US, uh, both the FDA and pharmaceutical companies, uh, they're both uh, thinking about using these iPA cells to accelerate the drug development process. Uh, they recently published a paper in which these cardiomyocytes were used to predict arrhythmia risk as part of the FDA comprehensive in vitro proarrhythmia assay or SIPA initiative. I think as some of you may know, all the drugs, all the drugs need to be tested for cardiac arrhythmia uh, before they can get approved by the FDA for uh, human usage. And then currently the platform is testing them on Cho cells or Chinese hamster ovary cells or uh, hex cells, uh, which is a uh, human embryonic kidney cells that artificially overexpress the uh, herb protein channel. Not ideal because CHO and hex cells are obviously not uh, cardiomyocytes. And so here, as you can see, the investigators use one consensus protocol, two human cell lines, three continents involved, 28 blinded drugs, two statistical models, and 10 volunteer labs. And importantly, they were able to show an 87% prediction rate, uh, which is very good considering that this is actually one of the earliest studies by the FDA SIPA group, and therefore there's gonna be significant room for uh, improvement in the future. 
So one of the goals in my lab is to start creating a uh, human encyclopedia, a human encyclopedia of transcriptomic signatures of drug responses on heart tissues. Uh, this is of interest to us. And so shown here are two examples whereby we assess the effects of four different kinds of calcium channel blockers, nifedipine, amnotopine, diltizin, and verapamil. Also four different kinds of common statins uh, uh, on the right, which are atovastatin, lovastatin, simvastatin, and fluvastatin. And so what is interesting to us is that you will see gene expression patterns that are different among uh, these uh, drugs, and also among different individuals. And this suggests that even though they belong to the same class of drugs, they may exert very different effects uh, within uh, each one of us. And in a more recent follow-up study on statin, uh, we used uh, iPS cells and multiomics to dig deeper into the role of uh, vascular health uh, for statins. Some of you may know that statins are given to over four, 40 million uh, adults in the US, including myself. I'm taking a total statin. Uh, but there's st uh, still a lot more uh, we don't understand about the beneficial effects of statins uh, beyond just lowering your LDL cholesterol. And so in panel A here, we uh, use a taxi and we observe, uh, for example, gene changes uh, in the uh, gene accessibility uh, for the iPS cell-derived endothelial cells treated with uh, simvastatin. And more specifically, we found uh, these uh, regions were linked to the EAPTET motifs. And then in panel D here, uh, we showed that when we look at the downstream pathway of statin target, which is typically the HMG-CoA reductase, we found that the YAP uh, downregulation was not related to cholesterol, but actually to an enzyme called geronal geronal transferase. And interestingly, in panel B here, we showed that when we mimic the type 2 diabetes conditions in iPS endothelial cells, we found that the simvastatin could protect the cells from these uh, endothelial dysfunction through epigenetic regulation of YAP, which then controls genes that are involved in the endothelial to mesenchymal uh, uh, transition. And then panel C here, finally, uh, we validated uh, this in a diabetic mouse model and confirmed the in vitro protective effect of uh, uh, statin. Now, in my opinion, uh, the drug discovery application will significantly, significantly advance in the next uh, decade. And this is mainly due to the remarkable progress in AI machine learning technologies. And so here, for example, working with uh, scientists uh, at the Greenstone Biosciences, we routinely use AI machine learning software that allows us to analyze the protein structure uh, by in silico molecular docking. Once we know the molecular target and protein structure, the disease that we're going after, we can do virtual uh, library screen. For example, in this case, we can do about a screen of one billion compounds at a time. It'll take us about two and a half weeks. Once we came up with drug hits, instead of testing them on mouse, we'll be testing them on patient iPS cells that have the exact disease, the disease that we designed uh, the drugs for. We think this is much more accurate and much more clinically relevant uh, because, uh, as you all know, mouse and humans are not uh, the same. In this case here, in case you're wondering, uh, this video shows three drugs that bind to the uh, protein target that we're interested in. Here you can see that the drug in pink uh, binds to the target, whereas the other two drugs do not. And so the drug in pink color will be something that we will pursue uh, instead of the other two uh, drugs. So as an example, uh, here we focus on the uh, vascular uh, inflammation effects of uh, marijuana. And I think uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, interest in marijuana because uh, this is being used increasingly in the U.S. Uh, due to legalization. And then what's interesting is that the U.K. Biobank data set shows that marijuana use is also associated with increased myocardial infarction. However, the exact mechanism is uh, unknown. And here we show that uh, THC, this is a psychedelic uh, component of marijuana, it actually causes vascular inflammation oxidative stress uh, using iPS cell derived uh, endothelial cells. And the mechanism is the binding of the TSC uh, to the cannabinoid 1 receptor, a CB1 receptor, which activates the MAP kinase pathways, which then uh, causes oxidative stress, inflammation, and cell death. And importantly, using again the in silico uh, screen that I showed you earlier, in panel C and D, we found that genestin, which is isoflavone, uh, it serves as a neutral CB1 antagonist and it can competitively block the binding of TSC uh, to the CB1 receptor and hence block the harmful cardiovascular effects of a TSC. And then finally, as shown in the cartoon here, we also confirmed the harmful effects of marijuana in these uh, two independent uh, mouse models. 
So as you can see from these examples I just show you, uh, we're now integrating uh, iPS cell biology with various cellular, molecular, and functional readouts, and also multi-omics analysis to help us better understand the disease at a systems biology level. Uh, I think in the next few years, you'll see more and more examples of uh, investigators using these large-scale human iPS cell population to study various differentiated cell types, uh, to study expression quantitative trait loci, or EQTL, and also to study genotype-phenotype correlation through uh, co-expression uh, networks. So uh, I just want to show you an example. This is a project that we're working on with FDA Cersei to study 200 patients, uh, generate the iPS cells, pool them together at 20 lines per cell valence, and this allows us to expedite the workflow and also expose them to increasing doses of uh, doxorubicin. And as long as we know the DNA sequencing of each patient, we can then use single-cell RNA-seq to help us deconvolute which data set uh, come from uh, which patient. This allows us to dramatically increase the throughput. It also allows us to elucidate the EQTL that is associated with the doxorubicin. Uh, we think this approach is probably more accurate than the traditional uh, clinical GWAS studies due to the variability in access to healthcare by our patients. Uh, uh, due to the differences in socioeconomic uh, status that could affect the uh, GWAS studies, and also due to the simple fact that about 35% of our patients whom we prescribe a medication actually do not take the medication at all. And here, these iPS cells are locked in the incubator, so they have to give the medication that we give uh, to them. So with that, I, you know, I just want to shift to the last part of my talk, and I want to touch upon how we can then use iPS cell to implement this concept of clinical trials in a dish as uh, highlighted in my, uh, uh, the overview of my talk. Here the concept is that we should be able to recruit patients, generate their differentiated cell types of interest, test which patients respond to drugs and which patients do not by using their iPS cells as a surrogate readout, and then go back to perform the actual clinical study in the patients who are positive responders uh, to the drug. And that way you have a higher chance of success rate for your phase one, two, clinical trials, decrease the cost, and also accelerate the timeline for drug development. Uh, in my opinion, this IPSR model is ideal. It's ideal for developing new drugs or repurposing existing drugs for rare orphan diseases. Uh, there are about 7,000 rare orphan diseases known to exist, yet only about 770 orphan drugs that have been approved by the FDA. Uh, and then the idea, again, is to generate IPSR from these rare orphan disease patients test which drugs work and which one do not, and then give it back to the patient. So as one example, in this uh, first trial of drugs that using iPS cells as a model, the Japanese investigators here study patients with a rare uh, genetic disease called fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, or FOP, also known as Munchmeyer disease. This disease is caused by a mutation in the ACVR1, or activin receptor type 1 gene, in a bone morphogenic pathway, BMP pathway. It is very rare, occurs in about one per million people. So, and then these are affected individuals essentially live for about 40 years, uh, and they die when their muscles and tendons are turned into bone. So that's why it's also called a mummy uh, disease. Now, because it is so rare, it would have not been possible to do a conventional uh, clinical trial. And here, the Japanese investigators uh, generated their uh, cells from these FOP patients, screened for about 6,800 drugs, identify rapamycin as an effective molecule for preventing the bone formation, and now initiated a phase one clinical uh, trial. So let's get back to this uh, case that I talked about uh, in the beginning, about this 57-year-old woman, uh, man uh, whose uh, genetic uh, panel shows a pathogenic variant in Labmin AC, and how we can tie everything all together with iPS cells, genome editing, clinical sequencing. So about six years ago, uh, we were referred this uh, large family uh, by our colleague in which uh, this family has a Lamin AC frame shift mutation that leads to early termination. And then the Lamin cardiomyopathy accounts for about 10% of familial dilated cardiomyopathy, so roughly in about one per 25,000 people. And in this large family, many of them had cardiomyopathy, atrial fibrillation, atrial ventricular block. More importantly, eight of them, eight of them died from sudden cardiac death. <laughs> And so using these uh, iPS cell uh, derived uh, endothelial cells, uh, we confirm that the Lamin mutation is indeed responsible for the cellular arrhythmia and also the impaired contractility. And as shown in this cartoon here, just as a summary, uh, typically the controlled cardiomyocytes 
They have normal expression in lamin protein, normal nuclear structure, and normal lamin-associated domain. But the patients with the lamin AC mutation, they have abnormal nuclear structure uh, that causes an increased open chromatin in the lamin-associated domains instead. And then this then leads to activation of genes that should have been silenced in otherwise uh, healthy conditions. And using RNA seq in the taxi, we also identify a PDGF signaling pathway as one of those abnormally activated genes in these uh, lamin patients. And then we uh, did a, a compound library screen to show that one of the FDA approved uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, sunitinib, as well as another one that's not yet approved, that quinolinib, at very low doses, they can actually be used to reverse the abnormal phenotype of these uh, mutant uh, cardiomyocytes. But obviously, it's probably not ideal for us to give a TKIs at the long term uh, for these uh, cardiomyopathy patients. And so we actually, uh, uh, what was uh, interesting uh, to us later on is that we actually noticed that many of these lamin patients within this family, uh, they develop early onset hypertension at about age 30s and 40s. Age 30s and 40s, they have high blood pressure. Uh, so we decided to then take their iPS cells, uh, generate their endothelial cells to <laughs> model this uh, vascular uh, dysfunction. Uh, we then perform a whole battery of these functional assays and identify KRF2 as a potential transcription factor that is responsible for the endothelial dysfunction. And then using chemical library screen, we found that lovastatin, uh, which is a potent KRF2 agonist, can be used to rescue the endothelial dysfunction as shown in this uh, cartoon here. And so now comes the final step. Uh, we want to test to see if this is true or not in the patients uh, themselves. And so the same lamin patients whom we tested the iPSL endothelial cells were asked to return to our clinic. They were treated with the lovastatin daily, even though they don't have high cholesterol. And the clinical data is shown here. We use Endopad, uh, which is a machine that can measure flow-mediated dilatation during reactive hyperemia. Normal index is 1.67 and above. And as you can see here, lamin patient number two started with a poor index of 0 0.48, improved to 1.06 after six months of lower statin treatment. So just like the example I showed you earlier with the Japanese investigators involving the FOP patients uh, and involving rapamycin, this is another example of a quote-unquote clinical trial in a dish in which we first identify a large family with lamin mutation we then screened for a panel of FDA-approved drugs using the iPS cells and found that lovastatin can be used to improve their vascular phenotype by activating the KRF2 pathway. Um, we then confirmed these uh, in vitro findings, work out the mechanism before giving it back uh, to the uh, patient themselves. So to conclude, I just want to highlight the Stanford Cardiovascular Institute iPS cell biobank. Uh, so far, we have generated more than 1,800 uh, lines from patients with different cardiovascular history, ethnicity, and sex. Uh, in collaboration with, with the NHLBI TopMed program, we're in the process of uh, finishing DNA sequencing on these lines. We use PharmGK to help us understand how human genetic variation impacts the drug response phenotypes. We also have a robust uh, sharing resource uh, plan. Uh, we uh, work with the NIH on the biobanking, and also we work with the FDA on the drug safety uh, testing. And I think the last aspect here is very important if we ever want to use this uh, platform for accelerating uh, drug discovery. And I, I think as some of you may know, uh, the FDA Modernization Act uh, 2.0, this was recently passed by both the Senate and uh, the House on December uh, 2022. The law authorizes the FDA to use alternative testing platforms, such as stem cells, organoids, and in silica modeling, and also for some drugs to completely eliminate the requirement for animal testing before entering clinical trials. And the goal here is to improve the effectiveness of preclinical safety and uh, efficacy assessments, and also to reduce the use of animals in drug uh, discovery and, and developmental programs. The US EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, will completely eliminate all animal testing by 2035. And so uh, this slide is given to, my, by, uh, to me by my colleagues at the FDA. I think uh, for uh, rare orphan diseases, uh, for example, the FDA recognizes the challenges of developing new drugs due to small number of patients, and yet there are thousands of genetic variants for each disease. So now the approach is the SEP data generated from the cell models to uh, test the drug efficacy instead. So as an example, uh, cystic fibrosis, the drug Calitico, uh, made by Vertex Pharmaceutical, uh, was initially approved for 10 genetic variants, 
and now expanded to 24 more genetic variants. Another example is Fabry's head disease. Uh, this is a lysosomal storage head disease that is passed on via the X chromosome. The drug Gallifo, uh, made by Amicus Therapeutics, initially approved for 40 genetic variants and now has been expanded to 348 genetic variants. And so currently, the FDA is interested in expanding the role of a cell-based platform across all uh, spectrum of her diseases. And uh, again, this slide is given to me by the FDA. I think the value proposition here is using these in vitro for efficacy data to reduce the number of clinical studies to inform the regulatory decision making at the time of marketing application to streamline the drug development and also to expand the indications uh, based on the in vitro data. And so in summary, uh, I believe the uh, paradigm shift in the future uh, would involve patient-specific uh, iPS cells that allows us to understand the molecular mechanisms of disease. These iPS cells can be used to generate different tissues, uh, as shown here, uh, along with clinical genomics and next-gen sequencing. This then provides us with disease-specific and tissue-specific ex gene expression data set, which then allows us to use AI machine learning for molecular docking, molecular dynamics simulation, and silico predictions. And by combining these three here, uh, I believe it gives us better insights into the drug development uh, process and hopefully can come up with drugs that are more precise and, uh, and uh, more efficacious. And then finally, uh, these uh, compounds can then be tested on the IPA cells that have the, disease, the desired disease phenotype that you designed the drugs for, and hence completing the loop of this uh, clinical trials uh, in a dish. So this concludes my talk. I want to acknowledge my postdocs. Uh, my uh, graduate students, uh, instructors, and also my former uh, trainees uh, whose work I highlighted here. I also want to thank uh, funding support from the NIH, AHA, Chen Zuckerberg, FDA, and also um, my collaboration with Greenstone uh, Biosciences. And um, lastly, if you're interested in any of the cell lines that I described, you're welcome to reach out to uh, Greenstone Biosciences. They've licensed uh, these uh, uh, IPS lines uh, from the CBI. Uh, Greenstone provides these lines free of cost, free of cost to academia, investigators. Uh, and um, thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Yeah. I guess my question is like during the right IP IPAC, uh, the right cardiomyocyte, if one of those that like, SNF identified as associated with cardiomyocyte maturation, like does that prevent or have? Have you encountered have trouble like to derive the um, the cardiomyocyte using the patient iPSC? Uh, um, maybe I don't exactly get the question. You're asking about the uh, iPS maturation of the cardiomyocytes, mm -hmm. and wh what about it? I'm sorry. So using the patient iPSC, this says like the patient has one of the SNP that's you know variant that associate to uh, the like uh, maturation for the cardiac. Myocyte, and does that prevent the cell to like grow properly? Yeah, so, so I think if your question is about the maturation process, uh, yes, uh, I think these iPSL cardiomyocytes, just like pretty much any cell types, iPSL derived brain cells, endothelial cells, full muscle cells, liver cells, they are not as mature as the um, adult human cardiomyocytes. And I think there are several ways that you can make them more mature. For example, you know, Karen's lab, our lab, many other labs are using uh, better methods to mature them. Uh, you could use uh, metabolic maturation media. You could also use a 3D uh, engineering heart tissues. Uh, so within this context of different cell types, you can further mature these iPS cell uh, cardiomyocytes. But uh, if you're asking whether we can make these iPSL cardiomyocyte to be exactly the same as human adult cardiomyocyte, I don't think it's possible. And the main reason is that uh, the human adult cardiomyocyte has been in our body for such a long period of time. And uh, the in vitro condition is never going to be able to simulate that. And vice versa, the analogy is that, uh, you know, if I were to take a biopsy of a human heart cell, I mean human uh, tissue, or biopsy of a human liver, and I grow them on a dish, the first day it looks like uh, the, uh, the native uh, human heart, human uh, liver. But after seven days, those cells will de-differentiate because on the 2D condition, it's just not the same as in vivo. Uh, so I think if you want to do disease modeling, you probably want to make sure that the protein or the gene uh, that you're going after 
uh, in your iPSR model probably uh, exists uh, in the same uh, human uh, cardio mass side of the human liver, human brain, uh, before you have confidence to say, okay, I think this is a valid model to, to uh, proceed. Yeah. Maybe I'm gonna. Since you mentioned liver, there is a question online that um, I think maybe I'll ask now, and then we'll go back to the live audiences. So, how important is co-culturing liver cells along with heart cells for metabolizing the drug for these drug screening applications, or any other organ crosstalk involved? Yeah. So, uh, I think it's uh, quite important. Uh, you just have to look at the drugs. So some of the drugs are metabolized uh, by the liver, and in fact, many of the drugs are metabolized by the liver. And so to be more precise, uh, you know, you can co-culture them. I think a lot of people are putting them in what we call a microphysiological system, MPS, that has a liver, that has uh, the heart, and there's sometimes a vasculature involved and sometimes a brain. In that case here, you're really looking at the pleiotropic effects of any kind of drug on these uh, different organs. So you will see more and more advanced uh, models uh, in the next uh, few years. <laughs> Just keep in mind that with uh, these more advanced models, uh, the throughput will also drop, meaning that it costs more money uh, to do these uh, studies, it's slower, and there will be more availability. But the availability will also decrease over time as people standardize uh, this uh, process better and better over time. You know, just give you a historical uh, perspective. Uh, you know, back in 2005, uh, when, my, when I started working with these uh, human ESL cardiomyocytes, and we're using the hang and drop technique for generating the cardiomyocyte, which is uh, completely, completely ancient. And within that hang and drop embryo body, if we're getting one or two percent uh, cardiomyocyte, it causes the whole ball to beat. We're thumping our chest and say, oh yeah, we successfully got uh, cardiomyocyte, one to two percent. These days, uh, you can generate 95 percent pure cardiomyocytes with the eyes blindfolded, right? So the technique uh, uh, improves over time. With these microphysiological systems, right now, there are some limitations, but again, I'm pretty confident that uh, you'll, uh, you'll get uh, resolved over time as well, yeah. This is kind of a related question to the previous one about co-culturing multiple mm -hmm. organ yeah. uh, type tissues. What do you think as things move forward in precision medicine and other other disorders, w how important will it be to include other cell types of the yeah. microenvironments yeah. in getting the yeah. patient specific yeah. effects? So I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't include this uh, in my talk, but I'm just gonna show this uh, slide. These are two uh, review articles that uh, we've uh, published on this uh, right here uh, because you know there were a lot of topics I needed to cover but it, as you can show on this uh, slide here you know and this gets back to the point I was being asked uh, wh what are your trade-offs uh, right here so essentially your trade-off is really your throughput and your maturation and you know from going from 2D uh, to 3D uh, here and as shown here uh, you know in response to your question a lot of issues that you need to work out uh, once you go to these uh, organoid and tissue uh, model. For example, you got to figure out the uh, throughput and maturation. You got to uh, figure out the vascularization and perfusion as you make it more co uh, complex. Uh, also, you got to figure out the genetic uh, background, cell line variability, uh, the extracellular matrix mechanics. And then yet, this is also a key issue. How do you figure out a universal cell type media? In human body, we have a universal cell, uh, media because our serum it is, works for all the cell types. But in vitro, it doesn't work that way, right? The, the media that we use for brain, for uh, iPSL heart, iPSL liver, iPSL kidney, it's all different. So how do you work out universal uh, cell type media? And also optimization, uh, how do you scale this up for industry application? and how do you integrate uh, with this uh, other uh, organ on chip systems that you were asking, yeah. One of the questions was, how do you think about direct injection of iPS-derived cardiomyocytes for cardiac regeneration, for, for treating cardiomyopathy? Yeah, so that's an area that uh, we're working on. Uh, I, I think, as I mentioned earlier, we have a uh, clinical study uh, involving a human ESL-derived cardiomyocytes injection. We've already done uh, six patients, uh, and the hope is that you know, this is a purely safety study to show that these cells do not cause arrhythmia, these cells do not cause a tumor, and then uh, if that's uh, the case, then you can then move on to these uh, iPSL-derived cardiomyocytes. 
Now keep in mind that many of us want to use our own autologous iPSL cardiomyocytes for our own cell therapy. But at the same time, you have to think about the realistic aspect of the cost uh, that's involved in doing that. And also uh, uh, the whole process of generating your own cells, putting it back into you. It's not as simple as you think uh, in terms of getting this whole process approved uh, by the uh, FDA. I think in general, the other comment I will make is that, and you know, there's a lot of uh, postdocs and graduate students here. Uh, for those of you working in cell therapy, as far as I know, to my knowledge, um, most of the cells you put in, they die. Most of the cells you put in, they die, except for hematopoietic cell transplant, except for genetically modified uh, T cells called T cell therapy, meaning that when you put the cells in, these cells expand. Uh, when you put the bone marrow cells in, uh, as long as you irradiate the patient and graft, they'll expand. But if you put in um, iPSL, ESL, or adult stem cells into the heart, into the liver, into the muscle, most of them die. And so we still don't know why these cells die and what is the environmental niche that's needed, what is the other stuff they need to add to allow the cells to, ex uh, to survive and expand a, a little bit. And so these are, the, in my opinion, very fertile grounds of uh, uh, research in the future. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Joe, for an outstanding talk. Thank you talk. very much. And, yeah, yeah, let's thank our speaker again.